Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations. With us is an old friend, Frank Wisner. Frank served as ambassador to Egypt and India and almost everywhere else. A brilliant career of public service under eight presidents spanning almost 40 years. For more than a decade, Frank Wisner, along with other former diplomats, has participated in the back-channel negotiations that led to the JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, otherwise known as the Iran nuclear deal, concluded under President Obama in 2015. After President Trump withdrew from the deal in 2018, Frank and his colleagues continued to talk with the Iranians, discussions complicated last January by the predator drone assassination of Iran's rock star general Qasem Soleimani, leader of Iran's elite Quds force in the Syrian and Iraqi conflicts. Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, called the U.S. attack an act of international terrorism. Was the assassination legal? Was its timing ill-advised? Was it ill-advised? Full stop. Where does it leave us with Iran? Frank Wisner will tell us. We are honored to welcome him back to the conversation. Jim, it's a treat <laughs> to be back. Well, uh, first question is, uh, was the killing of Soleimani, in your view, an assassination? Well, before I try to answer that extraordinarily important question, I do want to repeat it's a pleasure to be back on your show. You've said just about everything about me but one thing, and that is I've been a friend of yours since we both attended Princeton together, and we're in the same class. Well, that's an important and fact. I also want to... That's like under, full disclosure. I <laughs> also want to underscore with your viewers that if they haven't had a chance to read your brilliant new book, Plaintiff in Chief, it is a masterpiece, superb, excellent reading. Well, you're too kind. So as to back the question, to assassination, back to assassinations. <laughs> I'm unabashed in my view that the assassination of Soleimani was a mistake, a blunder, a strategic blunder on the behalf of the United States. I believe that not because Soleimani is not an adversary or was an adversary, not that he wasn't responsible for the deaths of many Americans as well as military campaigns, sub campaigns of subversion on behalf of Iran. But I believe he is a, was a figure in an articulated state structure of a nation which we have been at odds with since 1979, but not at war. And our objective must be to find a way out, not deeper, into a military confrontation by killing another figure, in a, a figure in another man's government, we deepen the problem, not lighten it. And we did not calculate the consequences in Iran and in the region before the president gave those orders to conduct the assassination. Targeted killing. Well, let's take a step back from uh, Soleimani, Frank. Uh, what is the United States policy toward assassination. Do we assassinate? Well, it has been established American policy uh, since the Church Committee, to the best of my knowledge, that the United States would not engage in assassination. That's 1975. That's in the uh, 70, mid-70s. Now, legal... It was also, also the practice mm -hmm. of the United States in our intelligence services, the old Moscow rules precluded assassination. You kill mine, I can kill yours, and so there's no point in it. But I think it is an action that absent a war uh, has no standing in American political logic or is, is, is a correct decision. Well, legal experts defend the president's power to do it, and uh, they rely on precedents going back to as far as Clinton and Obama and George W. Bush uh, as uh, an exercise of our right of self-defense, which is undeniable. And an element of that is uh, how imminent is the threat uh, of the target uh, to the interests of the United States or the lives of Americans uh, and so forth. Uh, do you think the case has been made out in, uh, where Soleimani was concerned that he was either a threat to the United States 
um, much less an imminent threat? I, I can make a very strong case that he was a threat to the United States. I cannot make a case that it was an imminent threat, for there has been nothing on the table to indicate that there was some particular set of actions he was planning and directing against an American, Americans or American installations in Iraq. But having said that, there isn't any doubt that Soleimani was the agent of a foreign power, the Iranian government, with which we've been in crisis since 1979. And you have to keep in mind the crisis is not one-sided. We are not the victim and they are the aggressor. There is a balance of problems here. Iran looks at the United States as a strategic threat to its sovereignty and its security. And going way back, right into the period after 1979, we've engaged in many actions and they've engaged in counteractions. So the question is not whether we need to continue killing one another, but how do we find a way out of this confrontation before we're stuck with yet another endless war? And I think the record shows, Jim, the record shows that it is possible to pursue political outcomes with Iran with both eyes open and with a great deal of skepticism and care. But the case of the JCPOA that you mentioned earlier is a classic case of being able to find a limited strategic understanding with Iran that avoids war. Killing does not avoid war. It creates additional reasons to engage. It doesn't deter. It actually foments uh, d difficulties that we will find hard to overcome. Well, in his State of the Union address, uh, President Trump uh, showcased the assassination of Soleimani. He said uh, he was uh, the Iranian regime's most ruthless butcher, a monster who murdered or wounded thousands of American service members in Iraq, the world's top terrorist who orchestrated the deaths of countless men, women, and children. He directed the December assault on the United States forces in Iraq and was actively planning new attacks. Uh, is there any truth in this, or is this overblown? Um, um, what's he talking about? Well, there is some truth. Obviously, Soleimani has been part of Iranian state policy directed at deterring us and pushing us back and relieving pressure on Iran. That's been a state decision. That's very different than the decision taken by an Osama bin Laden or a uh, Abdel Latif al-Baghdadi, who are pure terror, recommend, representing no state. Iran is a state. Iran is a state with which we have signed international agreements. It's a member of the family of nations. We've got to figure out how to come to terms with Iran, not how to deepen and prolong the crisis. Use any language you want. When you face an adversary on the battlefield, I'm sure they can turn around and say, our generals have engaged in actions that are reprehensible from their point of view. That's not the point. The point is to try to get out of this problem before it engulfs us in another war that we do not need in the Middle East. So in your view, as a matter of, uh, of interpreting U.S. policy, does it make a difference that Soleimani was really a, an agent or a representative of a foreign state and the attack was committed on foreign soil without the permission of the sovereign? I think that each point you make is very valid. But let's remember, Soleimani was the commander of the Quds Force, part of the IRGC, and he is, his place has now been taken uh, in a routine of promotion. So we still have the Quds Force in the IRGC. The IRGC nothing, being the, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. There, nothing has changed as a result of this killing. We have not decapitated, as you will, uh, a terror threat. We have confronted a foreign state. And that's a real problem. If your objective must continue to be to get out of this problem, to get out of it in a manner that secures the peace and core American interests in the region. 
Well, just recently there was an election in Iran and uh, conservatives won the parliamentary uh, election in a landslide. Uh, does, do you think that's the result of the Soleimani um, uh, killing? It's the result of many causes. Uh, but one of the major causes was our decision to pull out of the JCPOA, which shredded the logic of the current government in Iran that by accommodating itself in an international understanding, Iran would begin to advance its prospects, a decision that was cheered in Iran. We then backed out of the agreement and began to punish those who continued to trade with Iran, shredding the logic of the agreement in the first place, weakening the political appeal of Rouhani and his government. Rouhani and opening being the prime minister. Is the pro president. President. And, yep. and weakening Rouhani's appeal and driving the electorate to look for an alternative. Now, in addition, uh, the way the Iranian political system works, a lot of the liberal candidates were excluded from the election. So there are many causes, but there is no doubt that popular discontent angered over the death of a popular figure in Iran, their general, Qasem Soleimani, contributed to the current victory of the conservatives. So you, do you think that the assassination has made diplomacy more difficult? I think it has. I think it has. And that's what is my primary preoccupation. So we've made matters worse. It's made matters worse, made the path of finding a basis of understandings that would de-escalate the current tensions between the United States and other regional friends of ours and Iran, and then moving from there to more binding agreements along the lines of the JCPOA, but extending it to how Iran and the Middle East live in harmony, or at least live viably with one another in the future. Well, uh, Trump saw the JCPOA as the Iran nuclear deal as flawed. Was it flawed? Uh, all agreements, no agreement has ever been negotiated that it accrues pa all the advantages to one side and none to the other. We had to make compromises, and there were compromises, but none of them were fatal. And the most important point is that Iran was taken off the nuclear track the single greatest threat to world peace that existed as a result of the confrontation with Iran. Uh, now, Iran being pulled back from its, we having pulled out of the agreement, the Iranians are stepping back from their commitments under the JCPOA. And while they haven't taken any practical steps yet to accumulate the kinds of dangerous material that would lead to a nuclear bomb, They've removed the restraints in response to actions that we took. Actions we took, even though we were signatures to an international agreement and were supported by allies, Russia and China, in achieving that agreement. But they have uh, enriched uh, uranium since uh, Trump pulled out beyond the levels uh, that were uh, established in the JCPOA, uh, isn't that right? Enriched amounts of uranium, but the uh, quality of the enrichment has not reached a point where it's bomb grade material. So that's what, 95% uh, enrichment, something You've got like me, that. Jim. I can't remember okay. the I'm, I'm the not numbers. a nuclear physicist. If yeah. I were, I'd be doing something else. Uh, but uh, So uh, we've made matters worse. In your judgment, uh, should we have uh, tried to stay with uh, the JCPOA, as, which you would concede was flawed in some respects uh, and tried to work out our differences over a period of time? That's, that's what's commonly done after an agreement. Right. I, frankly, I, it's not flawed. I wouldn't say it was flawed. You can always say there are features of it that you'd like to see extended to, for more years than was foreseen under the JCPOA. But I think the real problem we had to face at the, when the JCPOA was signed was what about the other problems in the region? The missile threats, these wars that are raging in Yemen, in Syria. Uh, how do we deal with Iran's power reach into the region that threatens friends like Israel, threatens friends in the Gulf? 
How do you begin to get that? Now, when the JCPOA was completed, the Iranians said to us, we should look at the JCPOA as the floor, not the ceiling of our ambitions. We chose to destroy the floor. Trump argued that uh, his problem with the JCPOA was, number one, they were allowed to keep their missiles, uh, and number two, uh, they continued to be a bad actor in the region, and uh, that uh, instability in the region was caused by Iran, and um, the JCPOA didn't prevent that. Uh, well, do you have an answer to that? Yes, I do. I mean, I think the JCPOA addressed the single most important threat to world peace, and that was a nuclear Iran. Now, if it had tried at the same time to solve all the civil wars and Iranian proxy issues, all the missile issues and armaments issues, had tried to achieve arms parity in the region, we'd still be at the negotiating table. The key was to get the nuclear matter, matter settled and then move on and address the other issues. Are the other issues, can you address them? Can you address Iranian, Iran's presence in the region and Arab opposition to that presence? Can you address Iran's threats to Israel? Can you address the missile issue? Can you address the overwhelming air attack capability of Iran's opponents? Yeah, there are ways of thinking about that. We gave up. We pulled out of the nuclear agreement with no follow-on pursuit of the other issues. No plan B. None. Now, there were five other countries that were parties to the JCPOA, right. uh, and uh, Iran was bound to them uh, not to enrich be, uh, to weapons grade and not to enrich beyond certain levels. Uh, did they continue uh, to observe the JCPOA and trade with Iran? No, they didn't because they, the, particularly the Europeans, Britain, France, Germany, but many other countries outside of Europe were told by the United States that if they did trade, then they would be in violation of American sanctions and that they would pay a price. Their companies, their banks, their financial institutions would all become subjects of American pressure. But China and Russia continue to trade. Uh, China and Russia have continued to trade and we've not been able to stop that. So what we've done is traded an international understanding that constrained Iran's nuclear capability for an American-only offensive against Iran, which is heightened tensions, aggregated, aggravated sentiments inside Iran, made the pursuit of diplomacy much more difficult, and seen a sharp escalation in the tensions that we're having to face. Now, did talks continue after we withdrew from the JCPOA? You were part of a, really a back channel, sanctioned by the State Department. Uh, uh, I wouldn't you... say sanctioned. We never asked permission to be able and, and they never to talk. And they never denied it. Uh, we continued to talk to the Iranians because I and my colleagues believe deeply that you must find a political settlement. You must continue to explore one, you must explain to the Iranians our point of view, and we must be able to explain to our government Iran's point of view. If you're ever going to find common ground on which a stable political settlement can be reached. Yes, so we have continued our discussions. And Iranians. did you find, uh, did they continue up until this day? They're continuing. And uh, did you find they've been complicated by the assassination, more so than uh, they were complicated by the uh, U.S. withdrawal from JCPOA? You know, sometimes I'm struck by an expression I heard the other day that Iran plays chess. We play a much harder form of ball. Uh, the Iranians continue to talk with intermediaries, uh, with other nations, with Japan, with France others who can communicate with the United States because they are keeping open a door to a future political understanding. That's their objective. We've chosen maximum pressure by denying communications. And that's a policy of the administration. It's one I think is self-defeating. If your objective is, as I believe it should be, the achievement of at some point, and on a basis that you can verify 
and be confident you've achieved a better, a more stable region and peace in the area. So uh, what has been your relationship with the uh, Trump Pompeo State Department foreign policy hegemony well, in conducting these don't, talks? We don't <laughs> seek to have a relationship, but we've always been very careful and explained what we're doing and stayed in communications with our own government. We are, after all, Americans, and we're committed, even, we're committed to trying to find peace. Uh, and uh, so uh, do you find any hope for peace in uh, the present state of play? Not immediately. I'm afraid to say that the current policy of maximum pressure and Iran's policy of maximum resistance leads us to a period of pause in escalatory actions on the Iranian side and on our side. But I do not believe the conditions of future trouble are off the table. Imagine for a moment, it's not just the United States and Iran that are players here. It wasn't just Soleimani whose life was lost, but a number of Iraqis, including a major Iraqi Shia uh, military commander, Mohandas. And those people have all unrequited agendas. Iran may have sent its signal when it fired its missiles and told us of their military capability. But I can't tell you that all the other uh, actors on the scene in the Middle East have been satiated. What about our relationship with the uh, Iraqi uh, Shia regime in Iraq? Uh, after all, we violated their sovereignty in the attack on Soleimani. We might be kicked out of Iraq as a result of this. Well, the uh, Iraqi parliament reacted immediately and called for an end of the American military presence, but there had been a pushback among other Iraqis who want to see the United States continue its training and support missions to the Iraqi state. But there isn't any doubt at all, we complicated greatly the Iraqi government's life and humiliated it. We attacked inside their territory without the slightest warning and killed one of their citizens and a foreign uh, figure, Soleimani, without the slightest uh, preparation of the ground and catching them by surprise uh, produced the parliament's reaction. This isn't over yet. Uh, the atmosphere in Iraq is roiled. The Iraqi government's been weakened. And that is another strategic consequence of this action to kill Soleimani, is the weakening of the American position in Iraq. What about the United States Congress? I mean, shouldn't the Senate Foreign Relations Committee be royal? They were not consulted, and their leaders were not consulted. The Gang of Five was not consulted, evidently, before uh, uh, the strike was launched. I think it's a very valid question, Jim. And given the history of the Congress and the issue of assassination, given the Church Committee findings, it is highly appropriate that the Congress involve itself and set those limits so that we don't stumble over them and endanger this country's long-term peace prospects. Uh, so uh, do you view what we did with uh, Soleimani as an assassination, uh, or do you view it as something else? I, you know, the words have gotten very charged, but it was an assassination. We targeted and killed a major state figure in another government. That by my definition, it's an assassination. Suppose the uh, President of the United States uh, decided to uh, target the uh, supreme leader in Iran. Uh, would he be able to do that? But you, you see, think about the consequence of that, of that word. Uh, target somebody else's state leader. So what happens if they target our state leader? Why do we develop rules of restraint where we do not attack and assassinate other foreign leaders because we do not wish that practice to be played out on ourselves and to find ourselves in an escalatory path to a whole scale war. So, well, that's one reason, and I guess another might be that uh, assassination seems uh, shocking to the conscience. It's inhumane. Uh, it smacks of what the Russians did to their uh, KGB agents in England. Uh, uh, pouring poison into their tea. Uh, the United rubbing States poison, 
the There'll United States. poison on their door handles. Uh, or on their door handles. The United States doesn't want to be involved with no, something like that. Let us be very careful. For many years in the Cold War, we operate under a system known as Moscow Rules, in which assassination was precluded. Now that the Russians have decided to set those rules aside, requires a response on our part to draw lines very clearly with our Russian friends that we want to get back to a point where the rules are the rules and are respected. So did the killing of Soleimani accomplish anything, uh, Frank Wisner, other than to fuel the, uh, uh, the ardor of the hardliners in Iran, in your judgment? I search for some other positive outcome. I don't find one. You don't find one. Frank Wisner, thank you so much for coming by. This thank has been you. marvelous, marvelous okay. discussion. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best.